Amen. My name is Peter, as Pastor Stephen has said. Have we all sat down in Jesus' name? Glad to see you. Look beautiful in your African attires. Wow. This is how African looks like. We bless the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't worry. Where my African attire is, uh, it is in the blood. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I want to start by thanking the leadership of this church, the entire fraternity of DCIKZ and Shiloh, a place of breakthrough. It is a privilege to be here to bring forth to us the word of God, uh, led by Pastor, sorry, Dr. Bishop Jimmy Kimani, Reverend Alice, uh, Pastor Kibera, Pastor Brian Mwashigadi, uh, Pastor Millicent, Kaunda and Pastor Kaunda, and all protocols observed and ministry team and all the pastoral leadership. God bless you. It is, honor. it is an honor again to stand here to the praise and honor of our God. Straight into the word of today. The topic of today is discovering and preserving the wells in our lives. Discovering and preserving the wells in our lives. Uh, the better part of this year we have been doing, redigging and repossessing the wells of our fathers. Praise the Lord. We have been discovering them. We have been redigging them. But I like the topic of today that we are, it has a bit of preserving what we have been discovering. It has a bit or a part of preserving what we have been redigging. Praise the Lord. Can we have Joshua 1.8 on the screen? We want to start there. Uh, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, I can read. Uh, this is what the word of God says. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Another version says that keep this book of the law, keep this book of the law in your lips or on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Praise the Lord. Can we pray for the word? Lord, thank you. Your word is alive. Your word is active in our lives today. Your word is life. We love you, God, for you have chosen us today to receive your word. We receive it, O oh God, with thanksgiving. And we pray and we declare this day and this moment and this morning that could there be anything standing between us and receiving your word? Any high thing, any wall, any barrier, any hindrance, we bring it down. If any attitude, if any mind may be mind of Christ and attitude of Christ, God, we surrender our thinking unto you. We surrender our heart and soul unto you that we may receive from you and we may receive of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, that is Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Three things I get from this book. Number one is that you shall keep the book of the law on your lips. Number one is keeping the book of the law on the lips. Number two is to meditate on it day and night. So there is an aspect of time. Day and night. Day and night. Number three, it is the result of keeping and meditating. That is you shall be prosperous and successful. Praise the Lord. Uh, the Lord has always been in the business of inviting us to him, to himself. And that is actually why he came down from heaven to earth to invite us, to reconcile us. The word of God says that come to me all you who labor and, and are heavy laden. Uh, others, other places say that uh, if my people who are called by my name come to me. Actually, it says that uh, the Lord is calling us that we may we may be reconciled to him. Come and let us, let us reason together. Come and let us walk together. So he has always been in the business of inviting us to him, uh, to worship, to fellowship him through prayer and through his word. And to do so, there are certain wells that we need to preserve in order to achieve this and to keep enjoying the prosperity and success that the Lord has called us. There are some things we need to keep doing to, in a way, should I say to maintain or to to, to preserve the fellowship that the Lord has invited us to. Again, this is not our work, but we have our place in this salvation that the Lord has called us to. Bonus, if you will. So I want us to start uh, off by, by, by bringing down or by defining what are these terms we're calling, discovering, preserving, what are these wells that we are saying. And by definition, a well is a shaft or a depression or a hole sunk into the ground to access water. 
contained in, in an aquifer. Aquifer, it is a, is a rock that holds water. Where when the hole is being drilled, they drill until they can reach that rock or that water holding rock. That is what we are calling an aquifer. A well by other definition can be defined as plentiful source of supply. It is a hub or a harbor of something. It can be a well of oil, a well of anything, a well of peace in the name of Jesus. So a well is sunk through drilling or digging. A well, most likely or most especially, a well is sunk or drilled in dry areas where there are no water, so they have to sink. And that is work. To dig and to drill, we have been doing digging. It is calls for work. So that is the place of our efforts and of hard work. To discover is to locate or to find something. Discover, it is to find something or to recover if you may want. Uh, to preserve now, it is now to maintain something in its original existing state. To keep safe from injury, harm, or destruction. So whatever you have recovered or you discovered, now to maintain and keep it in its original form as you have received it. And I came to discover or to realize that the greater work does not lie really in discovering. It is very important to discover. But the greater work lies in preserving what you have discovered. In keeping, in maintaining what you have discovered. We have to keep. We have to keep. There are things that are so dear we cannot afford losing, brethren. This is our salvation. It is so dear to us we cannot afford losing. And we know in our, in our life also that there are things we consider so dear to us. They are of value. They mean so much to us. They could be relationships. They could be friendships. They could be jobs or careers. We do not want to lose them because it is, they speak some sense of meaning to us. There is what they speak to us. They are, we just cannot afford to lose. And the same way there are some disciplines in this salvation. Today we are looking at the wells of salvation. But in this well of salvation, there are some disciplines. There are some disciplines we are going to look into. And we are going to look into the discipline of prayer and the reading of the word of God and the lifestyle of love in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. So in salvation, it is salvation, but these are disciplines enshrined under salvation. There's the word of God, there's prayer, and then there's love. Amen? Amen? Of course, I know there are many, but I found them to be so basic in as far as this topic is concerned. I have also come to discover that the biggest lie the enemy sells to us or tells us is that salvation is a destination uh, you arrive at and you attain it all. Then when you arrive there, you, you relax. And then you, see so you have been born again by grace and not by works. Born as few, then you think or you tend to think that is all. That is a lie. You have not achieved all. Salvation is a journey. And in this journey, there is a place to hold and to faith. There is a place to press on. There is a place to, to submit. There is a place to keep working on your salvation in fear and trembling. Born as few, it's a gift, but there's, there's a place for us. There's a place for us to stand. Ephesians calls us to do everything after we have done everything to do what? To stand. Bonus few, eh? Yeah, we have a place to stand in this salvation. And that is why we need to preserve. It's a gift. It's a gift. And when someone gives you a gift, eh? maybe the next time they come, they ask you, where is my... Okay, well, I don't know why they ask so, because... You give it and then you ask, where is my gift? It is not to you as you gave me. But you have to preserve that what has been given to you. Bonus few, eh? You have to keep it. You have to keep it. So, um, there are things that we must keep doing. There are things that we must keep doing if we are to remain standing in this faith that we profess. Whatever we did at first to be where we are, we have to keep doing it. Bonus, if, you, eh? if you believed, keep believing. If you prayed, keep praying. If you confessed, keep confessing. What, if you worshipped, keep worshipping. Whatever you did to be where you are, you must keep doing it. The, the, it is easier to get at the top, but keeping at the top is the whole work, and this is where we are. I know this also speaks to me into my heart because we are all work on progress. We are working towards that. We are getting day by day, as Paul would say in the book of Philippians 3 12, if you can have it, that not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. To have taken hold of it. Uh, 
But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and training forward, straining forward rather, toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenly one in Christ Jesus. We have to keep pressing forward. We have to keep praying. We have to keep working on salvation with fear and trembling. We have to keep, we have to keep winning. Then we have to keep what we did to win in the first place. Bonus fear. You know, sometimes it's a habit uh, of, of, of me being a believer or us being believers. We think that we have prayed enough. We think that we have worshipped enough. We think that we have gotten it all. We have reached the realm of the Holy Spirit, the eighth heaven. Bonus fear. No. As long as we are on this earth, we are work on progress. We are pilgrims. We are sojourners. We have to keep on doing whatever we are doing. That is the only time we are going to remain relevant and standing. Paul again calls us to, if you think you are standing, check again. Check yourself. He, whoever thinks he is standing, let him be careful lest he fall. One as if you will. So it's something, it's work. There is a place of work. There is a place of work to, to do it. There is a place of work to do it. I remember when our president was being sworn in, he said that he was prayed into victory or into winning or whatever it is. He was prayed into that. How I pray that there are people who are still praying for the government, that there are people who are still sustaining or praying and keep praying. Because if it was prayer that took him there, then it has to be prayer that will sustain him. Otherwise, without it, it is not going to be as business as usual. So we believed. Let us keep believing. Let us keep believing. If you believed God and he did it, he shall still do it. The only difference is, do you still believe? Do you still believe? Do you still believe as you used to? It's such a topic that is, that is so, so sharp even to my heart and spirit as I speak it because we may have thought that we have arrived. We may have thought, and that is the lie of the enemy. We have not arrived, we are still on the way. Quickly we are on prayer. Let us look at prayer or on prayer, prayer. And in Ephesians 6, 18, if you can have it on the screen, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Another version of ESV says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. And pray in the? Pray in the? Um, I'm subject to correction, but I, I believe that praying in the spirit is not equivalent to praying in tongues. Bonus fewer. I love tongues. Tongues are good. If the Lord has given you that gift, pray in them and advance in them. Bonus fewer. But praying in the spirit records and pray in the spirit on all occasions. So what is prayer? Prayer therefore is a heart to heart and a spirit to spirit transaction between a believer and God. It is a spirit to spirit. That's why the Bible says pray in the spirit. So the spirit of God and your spirit has to contact or be involved. The Bible says that it is the spirit of God who knows the mind of God. It is the spirit of God who intercedes for us with the groans that cannot be uttered with the words. So it is a spirit to spirit communication with God. Prayer is not just exchange of words. It is a fellowship. It is a communion. It is spending quality times and the best of your time with God. It is having fellowship with God. Bonus few Yes, it's good to pray for our needs. They are important. The Bible says that God will give us our desires if we trust and believe in him. But again, that is not all. I think we have limited prayer so much to be, Lord, give. Lord, I don't have. Lord, do this. No, prayer should be a fellowship. Prayer should be a time you love on God. Somewhere a place you just long to be. Long to be. Because sometimes we have the wrong meaning of prayer, the, the wrong perception about what prayer is, and we find it so hard to pray. We think we have prayed for everything. We have prayed for entire Zimmerman. We have prayed for the entire nation, the government, everybody, including your family and the family that is to come. No, that is not all. One has fear. It is good to pray for your family that is to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, prayer is an investment we can get into the future. We can invest in the future. One has fear. It will never spoil. One has fear. Yes, speak into your future. In as much as you are speaking into your current situation, speak also into your future. That it shall align. One has fear. So, you think that you have prayed for everything. <laughs> you cannot pray enough. The Bible says that in heaven, the 24 elders do what? They bow down. They worship. Holy, holy. 
day and night, day and night, eternity. Like that is their business. So you cannot pray enough. So prayer should rather be a place of fellowship, a place of communion, just a place you long to be with the Father. Bonus fear. Um, a few principles of prayer I want to look at. Number one, prayer is informed by the word of God. Or should I say prayer should be informed by the word of God? Uh, this is to say that the content of our prayer should be the scriptures. The scriptures should always guide what we are praying. We should be willing to let the word of God shape our prayers and everything else we do in the place of prayer. In other words, this is called praying the scriptures. Bonus here. Uh, this is praying with the word of God in mind. In the book of Colossians, the Bible says that let the word of God dwell in you richly. When you are rich of something, that is what you will. You will speak out for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is full of your heart is what you will speak even in prayer. So is your heart full of prayer? Is your heart full of prayer? Praying the scripture happens when you read the Bible, when you are rich of the word of God. You read it prayerfully and meditatively. It involves referring or quoting scriptures, literally quoting scriptures in prayer. Kimu, last time here, he was here and reminded us that if there is anything, God is faithful. What is he faithful to? He is faithful to his word. So in prayer, remind him of his word. Not that he has forgotten, but take him accountable to his word. He will always watch his word to perform it. Bonus, if you will. That is what Isaiah says. He will always look for his word to perform it. So in your prayer, look in your prayers. Is there the word of God there? Is there a word of God there? Or is just complaining and lamenting the inflation and everything, which is okay. There are things that are happening. But what does the word of God say about it? Who does the word of God say about it? Sometimes you can even pray directly. I want us to have Psalms 139, verse 1 to 5, and then verse 13 to 17. Psalms 139. I find it so sweet, Manze, to just pray the scriptures, just be in the presence of the Lord, just exalting him, just worshipping him through his word. Because you cannot find better vocabularies, better diction than that is in the word of God. You cannot find better words. You cannot find better, better things than those in the word of God. This is what the word of God says. Take a look. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. We can go to verse 13. Verse 13 of the same chapter. For you formed my inward path, you covered me. In my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I will do what? I will praise you. So you are already praising. You are in prayer. You are praising. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. Amen? Let's continue. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. We continue. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. All. Are you not praying or are you not praying? You have already started praying, and that is just the scripture. But you have to read that with an understanding that it is about me. That, oh God, you know my getting out, and it's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of submission. It's a prayer of inviting God to take control, because God knows everything, everything, literally everything about us. One as you, so reading the Bible will always make our prayer life easy. Actually. If there is any prayer, it should be in the word of God. The disciples came to Jesus and told them, teach us how to pray. The Pharisees teach their disciples how to teach us how to pray. And he told them, then this is how you should, you should pray. And you know that the Lord's prayer. So you know it. And that is just the formula. It is good to pray as it is, but it's a formula. You need to adore the Lord. You, you need to hallow the Lord. You want to honor the Lord. You commit your desires to God. That is prayer found in the Bible. Principle number two, prayer is power. 
If you are prayerful, you will be powerful. If you are prayerless, you will be powerless. Period. Whatever power is. But if you are prayerful, there is power in place of prayer. That is what I'm saying. Jesus told them in Matthew 26 verse 41, watch and pray that you may not fall into what? That is the power that we need, brethren. As youth and as young men and women, there are a lot of temptation, there are a lot of, there are a lot of evil around us. What do you need to do to overcome? Pray. This is the only formula I find, maybe there are others, but this is the kind of very direct formula I find the Bible Jesus giving to avoid temptation. Do what? Pray and watch. I'm telling you and I'm submitting to us, brethren, that there are some appetites, there's some temptation that will not stand the power of a praying woman and a praying man in the name of Jesus. You need to overcome whatever it is, pray. It is not my words. Pray, keep praying and keep watching that you may not fall. Pray, pray, pray that you may not fall. Pray that you may not fall. Pray. Bonas if you Do what? Pray that you may not fall. That is so profound. It's so profound. Pray that you may not fall. Jesus told them, temptation will also be there, by the way. He never guaranteed smooth sailing or soft life bread and butter. He's, he promised there will be challenges. There will be issues in life. There will be persecution. There will be temptation. But do what? Pray that you may not fall. Praise the Lord. I like that. I like that. There is power in prayer. There is power in prayer. There is power in prayer. Prayer will keep you from failing. Prayer will keep you from falling into temptation. Number three, prayer requires discipline. Prayer is a discipline and requires discipline, if you get it. Prayer is discipline. Prayer requires discipline. Yes, I want to quote Pastor Millicent. She says it so well that prayer is hard work, but it works. Yes, it is hard work. Waking up early at six to pray, it is not easy. Some of us who are, we say we are night people, we have to sacrifice, sacrifice to wake up because that is hard work. We have to put that effort to do it. It's the discipline of setting your alarm to wake up at five or six and not snoozing it for ten more minutes. But the morning I said, take alarm six, I laugh and I say, and snooze ten minutes. Why did you in the first place set it at six and then you want to wake up at six, ten? What else? Yeah? It is a lie. Tell your neighbor it's a lie. It's a, wake up. Tell them wake up. Wake up and pray. <laughs> wake up and pray you, you, know, you know that's how like this sleep is you know I slept God you know nearly lala so late so let me just snooze for five more minutes and then I wake up and you had set it at at six so let us wake up and pray discipline is never easy Hebrews 12 11 Hebrews 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 12 11 the book of God says for the moment oh it is there no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful can you read it together from the top, one, two, three. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained. By it, it will be painful, brethren. It will be painful. It will require you to, to revise, to revisit your sleeping time. It requires you to be, to be cautious and conscious of how you spend your time. It will take some time. It will take some pain. It will take some pain. And they say where there is no pain, there is no, no gain. Those are English men. You have to be willing to forego something to gain prayer or to pray. Because prayer will yield something. It shall yield a peaceful fruit, righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Um, they call... Sorry, thank you. They call our forces, disciplined forces, eh? Is that in Kenya or in other places? They call them discipline forces because those, those people understand what discipline is. Um, I happened to associate with one friend who happened to be in the forces, and I used to admire their discipline. If they say they are not going past this place, they are not going. Believe you me, they are not going. If they, if they say this is it, this is it. Come and because mama koyo mlango till usiku it is there. That is discipline. So. Those who are trained by discipline, they can be seen. Look at your neighbor. I know they, they are disciplined. Yes. Amen. Tell them, thank you for being disciplined. You came early and you are here seated and listening. Thank you for your discipline. Yes. Time of prayer. Time of prayer. What 
do we, what time do we pray or what is the best time to pray? When is the best time to pray? In Mark 1.35, uh, Jesus says, or the Bible records of Jesus, Mark 1.35 and says, that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he, he prayed. Very early in the while it was still dark. Right now it is not dark. It is morning, but it is not dark. But Jesus used to wake up early in the morning when it was still dark. Uh, I'm not saying that early morning is the only time you should pray, but I'm recommending you to it. If our Lord Jesus Savior did it, we can do it. And you will discover slowly the benefit of praying early in the, early in the morning. Sometimes we just take these examples from the Bible literally. Jesus prayed early in the morning. Let us pray in the morning. Bon that is according to me how I find. But it is not the only time to pray. But if you want to pray at the time, pray all the more in the morning. Bon if you time of prayer must be specifically set. It must be definite time. Do not leave it open-ended. I have the whole day. No. But I will pray any time. No, there is no time called any time. It must be, is it 6 a.m.? Is it 3 p.m.? Is it 10 p.m.? What time do you pray? Ask your neighbor, what time do you pray? And ask your neighbor, time. Demand an answer also. What time do you pray? What do you, when do you pray? Be disciplined. Be disciplined to stick to a, your set time of prayer. Because it is discipline that breeds consistency. If you are disciplined, then you will find yourself, just, even waking up, by the way, if you wake up, they say, as a psychologist, they say, if you do a habit for three weeks consistently, you will find your body responding to it, even when, maybe ni kuamuka umezoya, six, six, six. The third week, you will find yourself awake at 6 a.m., and you never set your alarm. So set that discipline to pray, and then you will thank me later. Bonus here. Daniel 6.10, the Bible says that Daniel used to have three times in a day to pray. Three times in a day to pray. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks for his, before his God. Three times in a day. How many times do you pray in a day? I do not know. That's a rhetorical question. How many times do you pray in a day? What time do you pray? By the way, on a serious note, do you have a specific time you pray? Do you have a specific time that you pray? If you don't have, please find one. And stick to that time. Stick to that time. Frequency of prayer. How frequent am I supposed to pray? How many times? First Thessalonians 5, 17 to 18. First Thessalonians. Five Thessalonians. Pray without? How many times are you supposed to pray? Pray without? Yes, that is the times you are supposed to pray. Pray without? 18? Verse 18? Please, media. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ. I, I, I want to, to just make verse 17 part of verse 18. That pray without ceasing. For this is the will of God in Christ. Jesus. Yes, it is the will of God that we pray continuously. Continuously. But they're praying without ceasing does not mean that even in class, for this in class you are, you are up and down in tongues. No, it means you are in a, in a mood of prayer, in an attitude of prayer. You are just meditating on the goodness of the Lord. That is prayer. Even how you are seated here, it is praying. Praying during the day, praying during the night. That is, it is actually present continuous. Pray conti, continually. Pray without ceasing. This verse does not only reveal the frequency of prayer, but the manner of praying. How are we supposed to pray? Without ceasing, continually, and continuously. We are supposed to stay prayerful, live in the place of prayer. In good and bad times. In good and bad times, we always need prayers. Any time. Yes, prayers of yesterday are good, but I want to tell you that prayers of today are good and will work better. Bonus here. Yes, you see the prayers that you prayed yesterday night, eh? So you remember, oh, the prayers that you made <laughs> yesterday night eh, before you slept, eh, they are very good and they will work. But the prayers that you will make today, they will work better. One you, eh? Because it should be a habit, a continual habit. There's no time, I said again, that prayer can be enough. You cannot pray for every, actually, you cannot pray enough. You cannot pray enough. Actually, 
And the Bible even tells us clear that we do not know how we ought to pray. Oh, come on. We do not know how we ought. Eh, wow. We do not know. But it is the Spirit of God. So pray in the Spirit and the Lord will help you. Amen? Amen. Take time in the place of prayer. It is not just a place you, you rush. On your way to work, you remember, oh, I need to pray. Father, God, help me. No, take time. Mm -mm. Imagine you are meeting your friend and that is how you give them time. No, that is bad manners. Please give God some good time. Concentrate. And give him even your attention. Bonus. God needs your attention too. There's something called eye contact. Eye contact shows that you, I have your attention. If as a human being, I'll demand your attention. Candy, when he's speaking, attention. How about God? God wants your attention too. So give him some good time. Give him some time when you are fresh. Not when you are done with the day and you are just tired and you are just, I don't know. Give God some good time. And fellowship with him there in prayer. Amen? Amen. We are meant to stay in prayer, not to just visit. We are meant to tarry in prayer. We are meant to dwell in the place of prayer. We are meant to live there. We are meant to stay there. Prayer should be the business of the day. What I swear should be the business, should be everything. And finally on prayer, in Matthew chapter 21, 12 and 13, Matthew, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought uh, and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. 13, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of? But you have made it a den of? No, I'm interested in the other part, not den of this. It, it is written, my house shall be called a house of? Yes, a house of? My house shall be called a house of prayer. If there is any business that should be transacted in church, it should be prayer. If there is anything that should be done, it should be prayer. Um, and I want to thank God for giving us uh, a good church that prays. There's a lot of prayers in around here. By the way, there are prayers that happen every Sunday, 6 to 7 in the main campus, and 6 to 7, that here in this tent. There are prayers every Monday from 6 to 7 p.m. There are other prayers every Friday, every Friday by intercessory. Every Friday from 10 a.m., 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. There are other prayers in your ladies' group. Sorry? On Tuesday, there are other prayers. There are prayers, uh, men enough prayers. Every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday, 6 to 7 a.m. I know there are prayers by DOI. Are they called bended knees or something like that? So if you go from one place to another, every right and center, you smell prayer in this church. Congratulations. The church is praying, but are you praying? The church is praying. The church is praying. The church is in prayer. But are you praying? Those are corporate prayers. They are very good. Do you attend any of them? Do you attend any of them? Do not answer me. But you know where you can plug in. So there are, there's, a, there's a program and there's that opportunity for us prayer. And thanks to the leadership of this church for availing that opportunity for us to pray. Because the church should be a church of prayer. That is Jesus. Number two discipline is reading the word of God. Reading the word of God. We have to know God by ourselves. That is what I want to know. And it is the God of the Bible. The God introduced and revealed in the word of God. So if God is in the word of God, we have to read the Bible by our, ourselves. It is very easy again to receive and to, 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 to buy some truth and, and have truth and hearsays and rumors that go around if we are not grounded in the word of God. The Bible calls us to, to be to know God for ourselves and to mature in them so that we are not tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine. That calls for us to read the word of God, to know the Bible for ourselves. It is sad in my heart when I hear some people just misquoting and distorting the word of God and some believers believe them. Because you do not know, you can take anything and everything. The word of God plays a very critical role in the life and well-being of a believer. It is the food that nourishes every believer. 
we cannot live without God's word. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4 that a man shall not live by but by every but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus never meant that we should not eat ugali and managu. He meant that above that, bonus fear, food for the stomach and stomach for food, but they will be both Amen. But the word of God shall last. It is good to eat, but do you read the word of God? It is the bread that can keep you alive. It is, should be your daily bread. We should eat it daily. If we don't, then we shall be spiritually emaciated. We shall be, have stunted, to to a stunted growth. You are just stagnating. You are not getting taller. You are not uh, horizontally going this way. You are just there because you do not eat the word of God. So may we fellowship in the word of God. The word of God is so rich, it contains strength to keep you going. Truth to sanctify us daily and power to keep us from sinning. Grace to help us in our weaknesses, in times of weaknesses. And promise to keep us hopeful and to always believe and stick. Psalms, one, Psalms chapter 19, sorry, Psalms chapter 19, 7 to, 9, to 11. I want to read that. Psalms chapter 19, 7 to 11. The law, can we read together? This is sweet. One, two, three, go. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More, more to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb, 11. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. This is talking about the word of God, that it is sweeter, sweeter. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is sweet. The word of God is sweet. Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is sweet. He's sweet. He's sweet. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The statutes of the Lord are right. What else do you need if you don't need the sweetness of the Lord? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, at verse 16 to 17, this is where the word of God offers us a place of training and of teaching. And this is what the scripture says, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word of God is profitable for every business in your life. It is profitable for anything that you want to do or that you, you are doing. It is beneficial. It is, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for anything that you ever thought of doing. The word of God should play a central role in anything that you do. If you look at your life, do you see a trace of the word of God? Do you see something you did as an inspiration of the word of God? Do you see the word of God in play in your life, rather? Uh, there's a very beautiful paragraph from the Gideon's uh, Bible. They have wrote, if you have interacted with the Gideon's Bible on their cover page, on the first page, there's something they have written there, and I want to quote this. It is not from me, it is from them. This is what they say. That the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here too heaven is open and gates of hell disclosed. Christ its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, it will be opened at judgment and remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor and it will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. That is the description of the word of God. I could not have found any better way to describe the word of God. So if you have not discovered this, it's because you have not read the word of God. So read it to be wise, read it slowly, prayerfully, and meditatively. Let us be readers. And I want to bless the Lord because at least 
All of us, by the grace of God, we can read. We can read. And even if we cannot read in English, we can read uh, the vernacular dialects that we come from. If we want to understand it better. Let us read the word of God. The last discipline I want to cover is love. Tell your neighbor love. Uh, let me start by the qualities of love. Eh? And number one is that God is love personified. If you have been looking for, for a name to give to love, it is God. Want to ask you? Yes. God is love, as we say. Love is above all. Love reigns supreme because love comes from God. Love is the greatest commandment, by the way, and the second greatest commandment. You knew that, right? It is the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment. Ama si ukweli? Si ukweli? Yes, that is true according to Matthew 22, 35 to 40. Can we have it, Matthew? Uh, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as your self. 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the So I am just twice saying that love is the greatest. Love is greatest. It's not just the greatest commandment. It is greatest. Because on it hang all the law and the prophets. Like it means that love is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophecies. Because love is who? Love is God. And Jesus came to fulfill that love or came because of that love. For God so loved the world that he gave. That is love to you. That is love for you. There's a very good reason why love is the greatest. By the way, love is the greatest commandment. It is number one fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is the second greatest commandment. It is the greatest gift. Do your Bible study, you'll realize that. Bonus, if you will. Uh, Love is in Galatians, I say, I've said in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is start with love. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then joy, peace, long-suffering, and the rest. It has to start with love. So if we have to start doing anything, if we, we have to start with anything, we have to start with, with love. Before anything else, love. Love God, then love one another. That is the Bible. Let us read a very good scripture that I love in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. If we can have it in NLT version, I will appreciate. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A disclaimer before we read this. Bonus here. These are the words of Paul to the church of Corinthians. Let us read. And now, sorry, verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. That is verse 1, eh? Thank you. Thank you. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy, noisy gong or a clanging symbol. If I had the gift of prophecy and I, if I understood all of God's sacred, sacred plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be? Thank you. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained? Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Continue with some speed. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless but love will last. Love will last now our knowledge is partial and incomplete and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. 
Now we see things imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror, but when we will see everything with the perfect clarity, all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but when I will know everything completely, but then I will know everything, sorry, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows, uh, now knows me completely, verse 13. Three things will last forever. How many things? Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of this is? Love. The greatest of this is? Love. If we are to do any business, it is love. Love is greatest. We cannot afford to miss on this greater and so good gift that the Lord has given to us. Uh, the context of this is not to criticize other gifts. They are good. They are actually for the service and for the betterment of the church. But love should be the mandatory ingredient. Love should be the foundation. Love should be the motivation. Love should be, if anything, the drive. Everything we do should be activated and motivated and operated in love here in church. And then we shall admonish. We shall challenge and challenge each other. We shall grow together and get edified each day. No gift of God is bad. Second Timothy 1.6, Paul tells uh, Timothy uh, that fan into flame the gift of God that was given you when I laid my hands on you. Fan every gift. Please, if you have any gift, if you think you have any gift, use it for the glory of God. But what I'm saying is, use it in love. The only reason you can serve the Lord is because of love. It's because he has loved us. The only motivation for you to serve the Lord should be love. The Bible says in 1 John 4.10 that it is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the appropriation for our sins. Praise the Lord. So ours is to respond to that love. Ours is to embrace that love. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. In this is, in this is love. Not that we loved God. So whatever we are doing here, we are just embracing the love that has been given us by God. Praise the Lord. The kind of love we are talking here is the kind of love that we have read there in 1 Corinthians. By the way, this is the agape love of God. This is the best description of the agape love. And the agape love, what it means, it is unconditional, number one. Number two, it is not dependent on the subject. It is dependent on the one giving it. So the love of God never depended on you, Roba, because by all means you never deserved it. It depended on God, and that is the aspect of it being uncondi unconditional. So when you love your brother, do not think that uh, they don't look like they can be loved. Everybody here is a subject of God's love. Everybody here qualifies. The love we show to other Christian brothers, more often than not, depends on what they have done to us. It is a reciprocate kind of love. It is a, a conditional kind of love. I pray that God will give us a heart to love unconditionally. Because it is not dependent on what they have done for you to love them. Love them freely. Love them just because you are supposed to love them. Not because they have done excellent job. Not because they have messed. Just love them the way they are. That is the pure and the most pure or the purest form of love you can do. Bonus if you So do not look for something to love one another. Love them without anything. Love them. Love them unconditionally. Yes. Remove all these conditions and love one another. And then you will know true love. So ask your neighbor, how unconditional is your love? Or ask them, how conditional is your love? I want to finish by reading a scripture in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Then I, as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what Uh, that is Revelation 4, 1 to 5. Uh, I'm looking for the scripture that says, write this to the church of Ephesus. I'm writing this to the church of Ephesus. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. I could have misquoted maybe. But this is what says, allow me to read. Eh? 
write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in the right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all things you do. I have seen your work, your hard work, and your patience and endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the, their claims, the claims of those who, who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. Or I have this against you. You do not love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Church, you can do everything but still miss on love. And this is my prayer this morning that we shall not miss on the love of God. Because love is the greatest commandment. Love is all. For God so loved us. For God so loved us that he gave himself to die. It is because of love that we stand here forgiven. It is because of love that we have been justified. It is because of love that we have become children of God. For God so loved us. Let us love one another. Let us pray. God, we bless you because of your word. You have reminded us of your faithfulness. You have reminded us of love. You have reminded, reminded us of being watchful and being prayerful. You have reminded us that we should keep this book of the law, this word in our hearts. How I pray, God, that you shall give us grace and strength to help us in our weaknesses to be able to do that what you have required of us. Blessed be your name. We bless you. We worship you because you are good. I pray that every person here, God, that they will have the zeal, they will have the appetite to read and pray, and we shall discover the true love, the love that you have given and called us to be, and to love and to exercise. We thank you, God. We worship and we bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. The Lord bless you. The Lord do you well. <laughs>